Hello, everyone. Let's welcome our next speaker in Security Dev Room. It's Gills, and uh, his talk about implement incrementality and deck functions. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk during the lunchtime, or almost lunchtime. Um, so indeed, uh, in this talk, I will talk about symmetric cryptography. And um, I will talk about some, some considerations we've had uh, recently um, around the notion of incrementality. So when I say we, um, in this presentation, everything I'm going to say is um, joint work with the rest of the Ketchak team, namely Guido Bertoni, Johan Damen, Seth Offer, Michael Peters, and Ronnie Van Keer. Um, so just a bit of background on what we do. So we are interested in uh, permutation-based crypto. So permutation-based crypto is something, um, a new kind of crypto in the sense that we, instead of having a block cipher, we use a, a keyless permutation. Um, the, Ketch the name Ketchak Kim comes from the designers, originally from the designers of Ketchak, which was selected as Shatri during the Shatri competition. Uh, we designed some many stuff based on permutations, so we didn't stop at hashing. We also looked at encryption and authentication. We developed some new constructions. Um, one instance is uh, key duplex, another one is farfare. Um, these, uh, from, from these, you can build uh, encryption scheme, authentication schemes, or authenticated encryption schemes. Um, and we develop, of course, we um, design some, some specific instances. But yeah, in this talk, this, it's not going to be about all these new schemes. Instead, I would like to, to talk about what I call incrementality. So incrementality is the notion that um, if you have uh, some, some kind of cryptographic primitive, you have some input, some output, um, you can, from the input, get some output, and then you can take your input and you increase, you, you add some more, uh, more string to your input and you get another output, then you add more string, you have another output, and so on. You, you every time get some, some output on everything that you have, um, on constructing your inputs step by step. The key thing about incrementality is that every time you do that, you don't have to start all over again. You only pay the price for the additional string that you're adding to your input. That's what I mean with incrementality. And we're, we're trying to, to look around this notion, and we think it's an ingredient that can help uh, simplifying uh, symmetric crypto. So that's our goal. We want to, to do something that is simpler in, in, um, in terms of description, in terms of implementation, when it comes to authenticated encryption. Um, we recently developed something called a DEC function. So a DEC function is not a new construction on top of all your other constructions that I mentioned. It's more an interface, something that aims at capturing the notion of incrementality. And on top of this, this interface, we can build um, modes for authentication, encryption, and authenticated encryption. Okay, so um, in this presentation, I will talk first about incrementality, and for that I will take as an example the DISCO protocol, and then I will talk about DEC functions more specifically. So why is incrementality useful and in, in the sense that it can help us simplify things? Um, so the DISCO, I will, I will explain of course what the DISCO protocol is, but to start, um, I need to go back to the basics. And the first, let's say, incremental um, construction that we defined was the duplex construction. So the duplex, if you, you may know that the Ketchak is, uses the sponge construction, the duplex construction is just cryptographically equivalent to the sponge construction. The only difference is the interface. The interface allows us to have uh, input, one input block, one input block, one input block, one input block, every time. Um, so it uses a permutation, the permutation is F here, you have some block of input, and you can get some block of output. Then you have a second block of input, permutation, block of output, and so on. And if you look at maybe this, this block of output, this block of output is going to depend on all the past input blocks. So we have this notion of incrementality. But as such, the duplex is not really useful. We need to have some layer on top of it to, to build something concrete and useful in crypto. Um, one thing that um, we can do is to use the straw protocol. So the Shrub protocol was designed by Mike Hamburg uh, and it was presented at Real World Crypto three years ago. And so it's just a layer on top of, of duplex 
but it provides a really nice and simple syntax on, um, that you can use, for instance, to build secure channels or um, to hash the transcript of a protocol. And it's simple enough that it allows for a really compact implementation. So in, um, in terms of lines of code, it's, it's fairly compact. Uh, concretely, what can you do with the um, stroke protocol? You can um, have some, these are the functions, you can have some um, associate data, that is some data that does not need to be encrypted but you need to authenticate. Uh, you can input a secret key, actually you would start with inputting the secret key. Uh, you can get some output, PRF, and then there is this notion of client-server communication. You can send data in the clear, but besides sending the data, um, the, data the, the state of stroke will be affected by, by the data, so it will authenticate. If you, when you authenticate, it will um, also authenticate the clear text data. Receive clear text is the equivalent but from server to client. Send encrypted, I'm going to send some data, and, um, but in an encrypted form, and um, my state is going to depend on it. Receive is vice versa. I'm getting some ciphertext, and I want to get back the plain text, and I want my state to depend on it. Send Mac, I need to authenticate myself to the server. I send a message authentication code, depending on everything that, that was done so far. Uh, receive Mac, I, I get a Mac from, from the server. I need to check that it fits uh, my, um, my key and my con context. And then finally, Ratchet is something that um, yeah, uh, ensures forward secrecy. So it erases part of the state in a way that you cannot go back um, in case the state gets compromised. Um, here is a small example of a protocol on top of um, strobe. So it's a really simple protocol in the sense that we have a client, a server. The client is going to request a file. Uh, we want this request to be encrypted, so the name of the file is going to be encrypted. Mm -hmm. And we want the server to send back the file in an encrypted form. So I start by putting my secret key here. It's either a pre-shared key or a key that comes from a public key operation like Diffie Hellman. And then I have some context X that is going to um, summarize on what the state depends. Um, and I start with an empty X. So the next operation is AD. So I'm going to add to my context some associate data, in this case, um, the string nonce and a sequence counter I that is going to be incremented every time I use it. Um, then the string auth data, followed by the IP addresses of the client and the server. Um, so when I write that X is, gets incremented with all these strings, it doesn't mean we have a buffer with all these strings. It means that these strings are absorbed, and the state of the cryptographic object, the duplex object underlying a strobe, um, com somehow contains a hash of everything that is in X. Then I want to send my request, get file. File is being a file name. I just encrypt this string, get file, under the key K. And that's my ciphertext that I send to the server. And at the same time, I update my context with this uh, get file string. Then I send a message authentication code that depends on the entire context. So from um, the entire transcript of the protocol so far. Then the server sends me back the file in ciphertext. I'm going to decrypt it um, and get the plain text, so the file um, in the clear. I update my context accordingly, and then I check the Mac. The Mac contains everything, and in particular, it contains the plain text that I just received. So I'm, I'm, I'm now sure that my file was not tampered with uh, on the way from the server back to me. Okay, so. It, um, in the end, it's, it's fairly nice syntax. You can build many things um, of this form. Then, so strobe is only about the symmetric key part. What about the public key part? There is another protocol called the noise protocol framework yeah, defined by Trevor Perrin and presented at Hilwa Crypto two years ago. It's a fairly popular protocol in the sense that it's used, for instance, in WhatsApp and WireGuard. Um, it does two things. Uh, first, it handles uh, the public key handshake, so it does uh, typically crypt, um, FDP curve operations to um, establish a, a common secret key, and then it also handles the uh, secret key encryption and authentication aspects. Um, in this diagram, so you can see what's happening inside noise. Um, so I'm, I'm focusing on everything. I'm not going to detail this figure. I'm just 
showing it to um, point out that it's fairly complicated when it comes to describing what happens in, in the symmetric part of, of noise. So you have different primitives. You have hash functions, key derivation functions, uh, cipher, so authenticated encryption, and all that gets mixed in a fairly complicated way. Um, so the idea was uh, the idea of Disco. So Disco was presented by David Wong uh, at Black Hat three years ago. And the idea is just to take noise, but replace the symmetric part of noise with something based on strobe. And the idea is to make things simpler. And if you take the previous figure and now you look at Disco instead of noise itself, then you can see that um, the symmetric part is much clearer. It's just one call uh, to strobe every time. The entire state is maintained by, by strobe itself. There is no need to have different um, things running in, in parallel somehow. Um, you may say, OK, but maybe now the complexity is hidden behind these, these uh, function calls. Well, if you look inside these functions calls, it's, it really relies on the duplex construction, which, as operations, only need to XOR some strings into the state and apply the permutation when it's needed. So this, the kind of operations that lie behind these um, functions calls are really simple. And that makes the implementation of Disco uh, really, really nice, really simple. Um, here are some figures provided by David Wong about the size of Disco written in, in C, C sharp, and Go. And you can see that Disco fits in a few thousand lines. If you compare that to OpenSSL, it's, of course, much smaller. Um, I don't think these figures are really fair because OpenSSL does a lot of more things and they have many, many options um, to look at. But still, I mean, my point is that Disco can, um, is, is really simple. And one aspect of it is the use of the duplex object and its incrementality to, have, to allow for this simplicity. OK. OK, so starting from incrementality, we decided, yeah, let's, let's take a step back and look at how can we define incrementality? How can we maybe refine this notion and, and try to define things um, on top of a new object, a new interface that we call deck function? So what is a deck function? Um, I'm sorry, that's the most technical slide of the presentation. It has some notation, but uh, basically a deck function is a pseudo-random function that takes as input um, a sequence of strings. So the input is either one string, or two strings, or three strings. And it's a deterministic function. So it takes an in a secret key and this sequence of strings. And it's going to produce as many output bits as you wish. These output bits they depend on secret key. They depend on the input. If you change just a single bit of your input, you get some unrelated outputs. It's deterministic, so if you know the secret key and, of course, you have the input, you can compute, and if you compute it twice, you get the same result. It's pseudo-random in the sense that from the point of view of an adversary who doesn't know the secret key, these output bits, they just look like unbiased random bits. They just, they cannot, an adversary cannot predict them for um, a, new, a new input stream. So I said it's, it takes, um, it outputs as many bits as you want. Of course, you don't, need an infinite number of, of bits. And this notation is, I'm not going to de de detail the notation, but it just says that I can take n bits starting from offset q. OK, that's a deck function, but that's not all of it. Um, another requirement of a deck function is to allow for this incrementality. Maybe I forgot to mention that deck stands for doubly extendable cryptographic key function. So doubly extendable is really the, the feature I'm, I'm now describing, which is the incrementality. I want to have extendable input and extendable output. By extendable input, I mean, let's say you first compute fx over some string x. And then later on, you want to compute fx over y after x. But you already computed f of x. You have maybe kept some state. Then if you do that, the uh, computation of fy after x does not cost you, um, because the cost only depends on the length of y, not, not the length of x. You don't need to start all over again. You don't need to pay for, for evaluating f of y after x if you already evaluated f of y. So that's incrementality on the input. On the in output, it's, it's um, also very simple. I mean, you can take some, some bits of output. And if you need more, you just pay for these extra bits. You don't need to start all over again. Okay, so that's the double um, 
like doubly extendable feature of a deck function. Okay, so now assume that we have some, some deck function. I'm, I'm going to, of course, describe how we can build one concretely, but assume we have one, what can we do concretely with the deck function? Um, first application, very simple application, I want to just to encrypt some data. So I have my deck function, I input the secret key and I input some sequence number, um, a nonce, and then the output, I use it as a key stream. I saw every bit of my plain text with the corresponding bit of the key stream and the result is my ciphertext. To decrypt, I just do the same. I saw the key stream to the ciphertext and if you saw the same thing twice, you, uh, they, they cancel each other and you get back the plain text. So encryption, stream encryption, very simple uh, application. To do authentication, you input your message to the deck function. The output is your authentication tag that you attached to your message. Okay, um, now about incrementality. So you can have this, this deck function, the output is going to depend on everything that was received so far. So if you maintain a deck function and you encrypt different messages that follow each other, uh, then you can have something which we call a session. And by session, I mean that if you exchange some messages, and let's say you exchange three messages, the tag on the third message, the mes third message, so the authentication of the third message, is not just locally authenticating this third message, but really the sequence of all the messages received so far. So maybe this last message is just a confirmation. It's just a big uh, OK with the tag. You don't want the adversary to be able to reuse this OK in different contexts. Otherwise, you can, the adversary could send an OK on something you don't want, maybe. But in this case, because the tag depends on all the past, this OK is clearly refer referring to the context, which is the sequence of previous messages. So I think it's really convenient and comes naturally with the notion of incrementality that um, is buried in um, deck functions. OK, um, yeah, I'm going to go quickly over this um, slide. So we defined a mode called deck sane, which does this session-based encryption uh, using a nonce. And it's really simple, so you initialize it with some, some nonce, and you can get a tag over the initialization. Let's say you have a first message composed of metadata, something you want to authenticate but not encrypt, and the plain text. You use the deck function to produce some, some um, key stream, you encrypt it, um, as you've done um, two or three slides before, and the tag includes everything, including the metadata and the ciphertext. Now, because we already processed the nonce, this nonce is now great on my slide. It means we don't need to pay for it. We just pay for this um, cipher, the, the, to the metadata and ciphertext. And if I, if, I, if I have a second message, then I need to pay the price only for this second message. Okay. All right, so Dexin needs a nonce. It means that you need to have a sequence number. It, maybe it's a packet number, but if you repeat... Uh, that value, then, then you get into trouble. So there are other deck-based modes that we, we define. One is called Sansei, and the idea is to replace the sequence number by some synthetic, synthetic sequence number based only on the plain text. So you don't need to really maintain this, um, this sequence number. And the other one is deck WBC, wide block cipher. The idea is to achieve authenticated encryption with minimal expansion. So if you have plain text that already contains some redundancy, you can just re base yourself on this redundancy to ins ensure authenticity. And maybe you want to encrypt something into something else without any expansion. Because, of, of course, in Dexay and Dexance, you have this extra tag that increases the size of your cipher. So you have ciphertext and the tag that you need to transmit, so you have some expansion. With WBC, you can manage, if you have enough redundancy, you can just have your ciphertext whose length is equal to the plain text, full stop. So that's really um, a nice feature. Um, yeah. Then um, a few minutes about how we can build an efficient DEC function. Um, so recently we developed a new construction called Farfalle. Um, the name Farfalle comes from, yeah, maybe it's shape, I don't know. <laughs> um, so again, I'm not going to detail everything that's happening inside, so it takes a secret key and some input blocks. But the key thing to look at uh, on this figure is that the permutation f that is being evaluated in this construction, they can all evaluate it, they can be evaluated at the same time because they, are, they, they can run it in parallel. So you can parallelize your implementation and maybe you can plug in 
a vector implementation of this permutation. You can compute two permutations at once, four, eight, depending on the size of your vector uh, instru SIMD instruction, vector instructions. Um, so it can really speed up things. And the same goes for the output. All these Fs, all these permutations can be computed at the same time. So basically we define two instances um, of ciphers based on Farfalle. The first one is called Kravate. And Kravate uses a Ketchak permutation reduced to six rounds, so that's one F. Um, we claim that it has a security of 128 bits, and we claim that it also includes um, adversaries who would have access to a quantum computer. So Kravate is fairly fast. The only dis disadvantage is its big block size of 200 bytes. So we defined another permutation that was done recently um, called Zudu. That's a 384-bit permutation, so 48 bytes. And we define Zoof, which is Farfalle, using Zudu with six rounds. There again, we claim a security of at least 128 bits. This post-quantum claim was reduced a little bit because the permutation is smaller, and that's uh, just a consequence of this, of this size. Um, so performance figures. So that's Kravate on a Skylake processor. So Skylake processor is a fairly um, common processor nowadays. It has um, AVX2 instructions. AVX2 are 256-bit um, SIMD instructions. And using that, we can implement Kravate um, with a speed that is slightly, so it's slightly faster than AES in counter mode on that platform. Bear in mind that on this platform, there is the AES-NI instruction. So basically, the AES implementation um, is a hardware implementation, whereas Kravate uses just the regular, the general purpose um, vector instructions on that machine. OK, so last thing is about Zoof. So Zoof, as the name suggests, is supposed to be fast. but the key message for Zoof is that because we use a smaller permutation, this permutation, the state can fit in 12 registers of 32 bits. So that can fit in a typical ARM Cortex um, uh, processor. Um, it can also run fast on small processors. And because of the uh, parallelism, it can also run fast on IN processors. Um, so concretely on the Cortex M0 processor, that's a fairly small one. It's about four to five times faster than the AES. And about the same figures for, I mean, the same ratio for Cortex M3. Um, on Skylake, it's slightly slower than the AES in counter mode. But if you have access to the new AVX 512 instructions, then it again becomes faster than the AES in counter mode, again using general purpose instructions. So that's all I wanted to say. Just to conclude, in, in this talk, I tried to, um, to explain to you why we think incrementality in symmetric crypto can make protocols simpler. We've seen that with an example, which is Disco. Um, we also think that it can make some modes more natural. The notion of sessions really directly benefits from, from this incrementality. And then to capture this incrementality, we define the deck function interface. And we show that we could make some efficient um, schemes based on that, um, specifically using the Farfalle construction. And um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. We've got time for one or two short questions. So is there any other questions? Okay, thank you very much uh, for this interesting talk. Uh, it was not clear from the, your description of the Farfalle construction. You can parallelize uh, the encryption and decryption operations, but uh, can you receive messages out of order and validate the max that correspond to it? Because that would be a uh, very important use case for things like WireGuard, for instance. Okay, so if you, if you have out of order messages, so basically the, session, the notion of session doesn't, simply doesn't work. So you cannot really exploit it. The parallelism I was mentioning, it was not about this um, session mechanism. It's independent. It's just that this construction allows you to implement. Um, so the longer the input, the more parallelism you can exploit, independently of session mechanism if it's out of order or anything. 
Yes, the thing is, from the security point of view, we would like to validate Max, uh, Max uh, as fast as possible to avoid denial of service conditions. Um, so we, we, having too large messages is not necessary. Of course. So, okay. And that's why in, in this mode, we have a tag at session started. So you have a tag that you can immediately check just based on the nonce. So denial of service attacks, I mean, they need to have this tag correct. Otherwise, you can just stop there, and you don't need to, to uh, check the whole message. Okay. Thank you. We are out of the time, so thank you for your questions and for your talk. Thank you.